In continuing with our lessons about applications of the integral, we're well aware that the definite integral can help us find area trapped in the plane between a function and the horizontal axis. We learned in the last lesson even between any two functions that might be given to us. But you may not be aware that we can also use the definite integral to find the volume of three-dimensional objects. We just have to be careful about how we set those problems up. So for this lesson, we're going to use volumes by disk. So let's say I work for the Acme Rocket Company, and my boss has said, I need for you to build a nose cone in this shape and he sends me this in a memo and this is the shape he wants me to build a nose cone. Well, obviously he doesn't want me to order more materials than I need and obviously I don't need to order less materials than I need. So I need to know just what the volume of this nose cone is. So I can take this and I can put it in the plane in a very specific way and if I could come up with some mathematics that modeled what was going on here again I would want to be very specific about how I put it in the plane if I could come up with some function let's say that modeled from x equal a here to x equal b the top part of this nose cone how could I get that to be a three-dimensional model. How could I find the exact, using calculus, volume of this nose cone? Well, let's go back to what we did two-dimensionally and let's see if we can kind of pull that into our three-dimensional model here. Two-dimensionally, we took infinitely many rectangles that had heights that were our function and had widths that were just tiny little changes along the horizontal axis here or the vertical axis as we saw in the last lesson and we added up infinitely many rectangles that's what this meant to us it was infinitely many rectangles from A up to B and it was the height which were usually our function and then the widths which were that tiny change along the axis well if I took a cross section of what was going on here in my nose cone that cross section is not going to look like a rectangle that cross section is going to look like a circle and if I gave that circle a little bit of depth like so that cross section would actually look like a really shallow really small disk or cylinder and if we had a cylinder right we're gonna have a very small very flat cylinder instead of rectangles our cross sections now are cylinders and our radius of our cylinder is the distance from the midpoint of that cylinder to the edge of that cylinder well that distance is the same as this distance that distance is just our function in this particular example it may not always be true but in this particular example the radius of our cylinder is our function and I know for the volume of any cylinder it's the area of the base which for here is for me here is this circular base right times the height so I know that's what's going on here so if I wanted the volume starting at A and stopping at B instead of having heights times widths I'm gonna have the area of the base which is a two-dimensional area right something squared times the height well it turns out that my height here this distance is this distance along the horizontal axis which is the same as this distance that I did two-dimensionally so my height is still dx the only difference is is now my height is not directly the function itself as it was finding area now it's the area of this cross-section so this cross-sections area is a circle 
So this is going to be, let me find more space here, this is going to be the integral from a up to b, adding up infinitely many, starting at a, stopping at b, but instead of adding up infinitely many rectangles, I'm adding up the volume of infinitely many super tiny, super flat cylinders. And the area of the base is pi r squared, and the height is dx. And for me, I'm going to pop my constant out front, pi. My function is my radius, so there's pi r squared times my height. This is going to give me the exact volume of my nose cone. I can tell my boss exactly how much material I am going to need, I mean exactly how much material I'm going to need for a volume, not just an area. This is called the disk method. The disk method. And for us here specifically, we know what our function is. Let's move on to the next. We know what our function is. Our function is the square root of x. So as we set up before, we were going to start at a and stop at b. We were going to have the area of the base, which is pi r squared times the thickness. So do you see here, this is where we are. Now we have to figure out what a is and we have to figure out what b is. And I can see from this graph that a is zero and b is four. The square root of x squared is x dx. And now I'm down to a definite integral that I know how to evaluate. I can find the antiderivative. I can apply fundamental theorem. I don't need to drop my pi. I need to remember that it's the upper limit minus the lower limit, but that pi applies to everything that I've got going on here. So this is 16 divided by 2, which is 8. So the exact volume of my nose cone adding up infinitely many cylinders, starting at 0 and stopping at 4, remember instead of adding up rectangles and getting area, now we're adding up these cylinders, these disks, and we're getting volume. We have three dimensions. It's length times width times height. Volume, area of the base, pi r squared times height. That's three dimensions. That is some units cubed, right? Okay, so now we have the general idea and we've already evaluated that integral. So this application for the definite integral, adding up infinitely many cylinders, is called the disk method. The shape of the slice or the cylinder is a disk, and so we use the formula for the volume of a cylinder, which is the area of the base. That's what this is right here. The area of the base, which is always for us here, if we have a disk, going to be the area of a circle, pi r squared. We're popping our pi out front, right, times the thickness or the height of that cylinder. So here would be the formula, but I want you to pay attention to this because this is going to turn out to be true for us. We're going to be using the disk method to rotate all types of shapes about all other lines, all kinds of lines in the plane, vertical and horizontal lines, the axes, the x and y axes, and other vertical and horizontal lines. So you have to draw a picture. We need to be very careful and we need to draw our functions and we need to model the revolution for every single problem that we do. Always, always, always take time in this context. If it's not drawn for you, you draw yourself a picture. Now, just as we learned in the last lesson, we can find area with respect to y. We can also spin things around, let's say we had something that looked like this in the plane, we can also spin, area, spin areas in the plane around a vertical line, 
which is going to give us thicknesses dy. And so we can have disks that are not only vertical, we can have disks that are horizontal. So this is what that formula would look like. But hopefully you still see pi r squared times the height of your cylinder. So intuitively, it's still the same kind of thing that we're doing here. All right, so the method of slicing really actually should just be called, don't write that in your notes, write the disk method. Here is a step-by-step -step process, a loose guideline for applying the disk method to find the volume of a three-dimensional solid. So the very first thing you want to do is you want to sketch that solid and draw a cross-section. And we'll do a couple of examples so you can see what I'm talking about here. But the very first thing you do is you draw your solid and it starts by drawing the function and then by spinning that function around the line that, that they tell you to spin it around and then by drawing yourself a cross section so you can determine whether you're doing things with respect to X or with respect to Y. Then you're going to find a formula for that volume and the formula is going to involve a disk or a cylinder so it's going to be pi r squared either DX or DY so that's what it means by finding the volume. We're not finding the area, we're finding the volume. Then you're going to find your limits of integration. Those could come from limits or values that they give you, kind of like they did on the graph on the last example we saw. Or you may have to use a little algebra or another way to find those limits of integration. And then you're going to be set where you have the integral from a up to b pi r squared, either f of x or f of y, dx or dy. And so once you find your limits of integration and you have your whole disk method set up, then use the fundamental theorem and actually find the volume of the three-dimensional solid that they're asking for. So there's a step-by-step -step process for you to apply the disk method. So we'll start this example. I don't think we'll get all the way through it, but we'll start this example. And here's one where we have a region in the plane. You can see this blue region here, which is a function, right, that's just to the right of the y-axis. And we're spinning that solid, this area right here, we're spinning it around the y-axis. So I just want you to kind of get oriented to what we're doing there. So the region between the curve x equal 1 over the square roots of y. So they're already pointing us into the direction that we're going to be dealing with something that's going to have a thickness with respect to y. And they give us our limits of integration. They tell us from y equal 1 to y equal 4. So we don't have to do any extra work to find what our limits of integration are. And it is the region between this curve and the y-axis, and it is revolved about the y-axis. So this is how we're spinning. We're spinning about the y-axis, and it says find the volume. Well, remember I said the first thing that you want to do is you want to draw a picture. Well, there's the picture right there. I'm going to tell you this. Your calculator can't graph things with respect to y, right? It can only graph things with respect to x. So if you need to go old school, you have a relationship between x and y. Pick some y values, plug them into your function, find the corresponding x values, and do your best to plot at least a few points and then see if you can draw yourself a picture of that two-dimensional area and then the biggest thing that I want us to be able to do is to draw a cross-section, draw one representational cylinder so that we can see what we're dealing with here. Try to find R. Determine whether you are going to integrate with respect to Y or with respect to X. We're at the end of the video here. I'll stop and I'll pick up at this spot in the example on the next video. So look for that.